welcome to episode 7 of the Multinational One Podcast. Welcome to the Multinational Money Podcast. I'm Johnny, your host. And if you're interested in expat life, financial freedom, and making the most of global opportunities, then this is your podcast. I'm back with a familiar face on today's episode. Tara, a US citizen from Florida who pursued and achieved financial independence before going back into some kind of light form of work, is gonna be with me today talking about her journey to financial independence. What were some of the challenges in getting there? What were some of the things that she had to do in order to achieve her goal? And how life was once she achieved that financial independence. So I hope you enjoy the episode, guys. Let's get right into it. All right, I'm here with Tara from She Saves, He Invests, They Travel. Tara, welcome to the Multinational Money Podcast. Thank you, Johnny. It's been a while. When was the last time we spoke? Was it about a year ago on your channel? Let me um, let me look at some. We had that navigating um, international personal finance for young people mm-hmm. video seven months ago. Okay, mm. so not too long ago. <laughs> and that was to celebrate your 1,000 subs on YouTube. And now you're part of the YouTube partner gang. So welcome to the club. <laughs> Thank you. I'm not monetized yet via ads, but all the other options for monetization are open to us now. Nice. That's great. Yeah. And you guys are <laughs> making interesting content all the time with Thank your various you, you travel too. ventures around the world. <laughs> yeah. So guys, obviously Tara and I, we did, as we just said, a, an interview on her channel last year. Um, and Tara actually came on here about three years ago where we first had a discussion. We talked a lot about Tara's life in Spain as she was in Madrid at the time. We're going to focus this conversation a little bit more on the fire side of things um, and the process of achieving fire. So get started. Tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, your background, experience, etc. Okay. Well, I'm a native Floridian. I don't know if your viewers are familiar with Florida geography, but I'm sure they've heard of cities like Miami, you know, Tampa, St. Pete, Clearwater, Orlando. So if you can imagine that kind of south to central Florida triangle, that's where I spent um, most of my life. And um, I have a bunch of unrelated degrees, and um, I worked in Central Florida in that little triangle in the nonprofit sector, and then I became an academic, um, which, which is also a researcher. That kind of those two things go hand in hand. I did my master's at Oxford in England. Um, in undergrad, I studied abroad in Madrid, Spain. So that was my first introduction. Um, to to Spain. Um, I did my PhD at Columbia University in New York City, and I worked for some popular po- um, positive youth development programs that your viewers have probably heard of, like 4-H and Girl Scouts. Um, they're technically international, but they're pretty popular here in the U.S. And I worked uh, for universities, for Stetson University, University of California, and Columbia University. Uh, teaching, designing, and evaluating programs, and publishing research articles. And at the end of my career, if you could call it that, um, I was recruited by two tech companies to leave academia for industry, and I I did. Um, I took that leap, and um, about a year and a half into my industry work, I was laid off by both tech companies simultaneously. My, My paychecks stopped coming in on the same day so I was laid off from my job and my backup job and this was during the pandemic and then so I decided um I don't have anything to do so I'll just move to Madrid on a retirement visa I had plans on retiring between age 40 and 41 I was 38 at the time it was a little early but not too early it was close enough so I just said "Eh, just might as well do it now. And, um, the, you know, I, I did eventually return from Madrid. Um, I, didn't, I didn't renew my retirement visa. And I started a consulting firm. I moved back to Florida, and I've been running that firm ever since. So that's a brief background. Yeah, nice. And this is the journey that we're essentially going to explore, explore in a lot more detail in this episode, but very interesting indeed. Before we get a bit into your journey, actually, Tara, tell us a little bit about the idea behind your YouTube channel. 
So how it came about and what's your mission with your channel? Okay, well, it's called She Saves, He Invests, They Travel, like you mentioned, Johnny. And um, the handle is the acronym, but the acronym is not safe for work, so I won't say it. Um, (laughs) Yes. Yeah. I'll let your viewers figure out the acronym. We didn't really think the acronym through before we named the channel. Uh, But it, it basically reflects what we do best. I save really well, and my husband invests, and we both enjoy traveling. And my husband had wanted me to be on YouTube for a long time, probably more than a decade. And he kept trying to convince me to do it. And I just said, no, you just want me to make a fool out of myself. You want me to do stupid dance videos or something. And he said, no, 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 you really like it, I think. He wanted a diary of our lives. And um, I'm a scrapbooker and I keep a written diary. But those kind of things, you know, if one of us got Alzheimer's, if I got Alzheimer's, right, he's not, like in the notebook, he's not going to read those and that's not going to, like, it wouldn't help. But he will, he does learn by watching videos. And so I think that was his motivation was to get an online diary of our lives. And then I wanted to inspire and instruct. So I wanted to bring people along in the process of discovery because travel is about discovering new places and people and perspectives, new ways of doing things for me. And so I, um, and beauty, yeah, it's about finding beauty, it's about searching. So I, um, I wanted to eventually start talking about, or I haven't done this yet on the channel, but, um, how the people I've met abroad have changed me. And, um, I, th- I think I've learned a few things along the way from my career and my travels that I can share with others. So that's where the step-by-step tutorials come from. I wanted to produce something that um, reflects the way I learn. I I did a lot of volunteer projects and my students would ask, but, but how did you do them? We don't understand. Like we don't want a vague general advice or idea or storytelling we want the step-by-step so that we can reproduce it and I thought about some of their statements in some of my classes some of the feedback I got and I thought okay well a lot of other people learn like that and so I'm gonna tackle things that I don't I don't like doing I don't want to do I don't feel like doing them I procrastinate like how to file for an LLC or how to do your taxes or, or things like that and just really break them down step by step with screen recordings so that it's it's foolproof. It's kind of like, you know, the travel abroad for, for dummies guide or the how to start a business for dummies. You've seen those books. Um yeah, I mean I don't mean to be insulting, like, but they're they're kind of a genre of, of books and they're usually yellow and like If you read them and follow the instructions, you can't mess up. It's super clear. So that's, um, I would say, like a third of the channel are these tutorials. Yeah. No, that's a good good way to explain it as well. And I'd never thought of it as like a diary of your own lives. Like it would be, you know, when we're like 20, 30 years into the future, maybe YouTube's still around in a different format. Maybe not. Maybe we've all moved on. But yeah, it'll be interesting you know, if someone goes on your channel one day and looks at what you were doing like 20, 30 years ago. Might be interesting to them. I mean, I th- I thought it would be interesting to Chris because he would forget about vacations and he'd watch something from a year or two ago and he'd say, oh, I remember I got really sick eating that. And all <laughs> the emotions would, and the feelings would flood back as he's, you know, looking at the like little cake in whatever country or um you know, there's just certain details he would definitely forget if we hadn't recorded certain things. And like the ultimate vision for the channel is I want it to be a sort of one-stop shop um, for those who want to fire abroad or become digital nomads. And I'm just trying to think of like everything they're going to need, like visa immigration information, um, education information. You know, how do you how do you land those higher paying jobs? How do you get the skills that you need to be able to save and invest the amount of money to retire early that's going to be you know a portion of it how do you study abroad how do you um explore these countries how do you start businesses all all the different ways that you would um all the different skill sets that you're going to need if you want to um either be a digital nomad or you know retire early abroad basically yeah 
Yeah, very nice. Cool. And so with your channel or in life in general, I should say, where's the next destination on your on your list to visit? Oh, um, good question. So European countries outside the Schengen zone. So I think we're going to ask, um, well, the countries I had on my radar were Montenegro, Albania, and Serbia. But I think we're going to ask chat GPT and let maybe let ask me this was my this was my mission like traveling outside the schengen area from like 2022 <laughs> but that's a good list okay uh, albania definitely i really enjoyed albania when i went there montenegro haven't done but i would really like to go mm. there and serbia again haven't done but would like to go there other countries outside of schengen that are worth visiting like turkey i really enjoyed turkey um and georgia was really interesting as well when i went to georgia last year those are pretty far east yeah, they are, yeah. Almost not Europe. Yeah. Oh. In fact, part of Turkey is not Europe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Almost the Middle East. Yeah, half half in the Middle East and half in Europe. But yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely worth visiting. And and well, if we talk non Schengen as well, even though it's EU, yeah, Cyprus as well. A hundred percent. And yeah, and that's Cyprus. pretty far east too. Yeah. Cyprus looks yeah. gorgeous. You've been to Cyprus? Yeah, Cyprus is like my almost like gotta be my favorite country like if we take if we put spain to one side then like cyprus oh, really? is like there yeah, okay. yeah, yeah for sure yeah those are the plans for the summer we'll see what order it gets done and the only thing that is certain is the month in september because i've already rented the apartment in madrid <laughs> yeah 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 exactly very exciting plans anyway which leads us nicely onto the fire discussion which is how you get to do all this so let's go to the beginning of that question when did you decide to pursue fire and why it was around 2018 when i'd realized that i kind of had been pursuing it without understanding the name and that it was a movement i had a colleague send me via whatsapp an article about the fire movement and i was i was just captivated i didn't realize that there were so many other people around the world who they sounded a lot like me, um, very restless and somewhat dissatisfied with their careers. And um, yeah, she actually was um, pretty, pretty high up in the UN. So for her to send this article to me, I, I really wasn't sure if she was feeling it too, or if she just knew me really well and she thought I'd like it. Um, ever since I read it, I was hooked and I became more focused on... Um, the specific tactics used by the fire group. I started joining digital fire groups online and uh, reading everything that they were doing and copying some of it. So I uh, fired in 2020. So two years later, I was I was out. I was done um, by accident because I got laid off. I that wasn't the plan. It was supposed to be um, 2022. Um, 20, 2021, 2022, a little, little later. Um, but yeah, that's, that's kind of how it started. Okay. And the reason behind it? I, I was restless and dissatisfied with my career. That's rough. Okay. Yeah. I wanted to be able to say, oh, I loved work. There were certain aspects of work I liked, um, but for the most part, it, it wasn't for me. <laughs> yeah. That's a good... I think it's why a lot of people probably get into it because they see it as like an escape from something that they don't like. Yeah. Um, but probably as we'll come to later on when we get to other aspects of your fire journey, they might find themselves, you know, maybe a bit disappointed at the end of the journey in some respect. Should, but yeah, yeah, we'll we'll come to that a bit later in the episode anyway. Well, you so. shouldn't be running away from something. You should be running towards something. Those are different uh, Exactly. Things. Yeah, yeah. So... Yeah. Um, I, you know, I wanted freedom and control over my life and I was a workaholic and I just didn't know how to pull back. I didn't know how to have work-life balance. I mean, salary jobs were all or nothing for me. Like I was going to work 60, 80 hours a week to justify that salary um, or nothing. So I was either slowly burning out or I had actually burned out several times and not realized it and thought oh no, I've fully recovered. I can, I can keep doing this. This is okay. And, um, I wasn't I recovered. Like I, 
I didn't realize how bad the burnout was. And then um, once the the two tech tech jobs um, laid me off at the same time, that was my plan A, my plan B. Like, I don't really think you're supposed to have a plan C. I mean, to me, like a social contract had been broken fundamentally. Like there was something very wrong to me in the workplace when when that can happen. And I was slowly realizing it because I was hired as an independent contractor for the one company who laid me off. And the other company, I was just volunteering to help them get their projects across the finish line. And they said that, you know, basically I would have to keep working for free for a year until the company fully financially recovered. And it was a moment of, of, of truth, of reckoning to me where I, I was just working to make other people richer. And I wasn't enriching my life. Like, it wasn't serving me in any way. That's profound, <laughs> yeah. But it's a very good and important realization to, to have, and I think it's good that you had that as well. Yeah, I sort of realized, like, there's no such thing as job security except the job security you create for yourself. Yeah, that's so true. I think if you have a skill that makes you valuable, um, then you can make your own way. I think I said this in another episode as well, but yeah, like you, 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 you can determine like your own, like employability, security, and pers personal and financial security in that sense by investing in yourself and developing yourself and making yourself valuable to others. Coming back to what you said about burnout, um, wasn't on the, it <laughs> wasn't on the list of questions, but I'd be curious to know, how did you know when you were burnt out? Um, well, I had trouble understanding that I was burned out. Um, so, I, like, I actually had trouble until I started reading about burnout and some of the symptoms sounded like me. Um, just poor uh, emotional regulation, um, insomnia. I would walk around the house in circles in the middle of the night, Um I'd stay up all night. I wouldn't be able to sleep for no reason. I could not shut my mind down. And lack of motivation and procrastination that started um, seeping in uh, towards the end of my career uh, in bouts and fits and spurts. Um, I had increasing trouble concentrating. So there were just, and just a lot of like negative affect, like negative mood just yeah from a psychological perspective if burnout is indeed a real psychological concept and i think that it is um i was definitely feeling all the negative emotions like despair um i'd like slipped into nihilism a little bit like what is the point of anything anymore no yeah but it's important like if someone is listening like if you know you feel like it might be, or you might be on that path, like it's good to, you know, like take a step back and just assess things before it gets mm -hmm. to where you were. Yeah. Certainly, yeah. yeah. Because, yeah, like looking after your, you know, like health, they say like health is wealth. Like you can have, you can be financially independent. You can like be retired with millions of euros and dollars. But if you're unhappy, like if you're unfit, like if you're emotionally unwell, yeah. then... What's the point? Yeah. Yeah. I would, um, I was making a lot of money finally towards the end of my career and it wasn't worth it. I was happier. I'm happier now making like, uh, you know, 10, 15% of what I was making. I would have panic attacks at work, which were interesting because they just kind of were like a feeling of nausea and I would like stare into space and like lose track of time. Like I'd blink. And like a half an hour had gone by and I'd be so sick. I couldn't um, move. Like I'd miss meetings. Like my panic attacks are not like what you see in the movies. They're not um, dramatic. They're very subtle. So I had a hard time recognizing that I was having them. I, I was teaching a class and collapsed at one point. And um, I'd had like a severe Charlie horse in my foot from probably a potassium deficiency. And... Um, just like wearing business casual too much, like high heels and um, dehydration. And that's just like from like 
you you eat at your desk fast food to have a working lunch. You pick up a coffee and croissant, like full of sugar on your way to work, eat while you're walking. Like you're not focusing on your nutrition. You're you're not getting any sleep. You're living off of caffeine. And my colleagues were like living off of like caffeine, nicotine, and alcohol. Like they were, their health was, they're going to lose decades from their lives. And like, if you have a commute, your life's going to be several years shorter than it should be. It's, I mean, all this is like slowly killing you basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It makes me appreciate more like in Europe, the culture of unwinding, taking the time to have lunch kind of thing. Granted, I'm someone that uh, sometimes rushes lunch and meals as well because I have a lot of things on, but definitely uh, it's something good over you here. You hustle. I mean, you have every schedule, every second of your day scheduled, it seems like. As of last week, yes. Like I got to a point, honestly, I got to a point like last week when I just, I couldn't, I looked at like, I stopped and I was like, how am I going to do everything? Like, I, there's so much, I can't keep track of it all. And then I finally just sat down. I was like, okay, Google Calendar, Google Tasks, map everything out. And now, one, I realize how busy I am. But two, like, I'm so much more organized and less stressed about it. So that's good. Yeah. I don't know, Johnny. Like, I think you're going to, because you're, um, you're either in your late 20s or early 30s. I don't know exactly how old you are. And I think with being younger, you still have the energy to keep doing this like living the way you're living yeah i think do you think you're gonna come to a point of reckoning where you're like i can't railroad my schedule anymore i can't jam in all this stuff yeah no no i'm, I'm getting there like uh, i am late late 20s turning 30 this year um and yeah like already i'm starting to see like okay like i make enough from millennials with money or whatever hustle that i have that I need to outsource something to get back mm -hmm. my time to focus on other yeah. things and to have like, not not only to like do other activities that are important for the channel, but also to have time for myself as well. So it's, yeah, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. Like I've managed to keep it going up to now, but probably there will come a time when, yeah, I'm gonna have to scale it back. Because yeah. at 28, I still felt like superwoman and had the energy. But by 38, I'll yeah. It was a world of difference. Like, tack on another decade of running at this pace. It's a marathon, not a sprint. And you, you, you've been sprinting. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. You're right. No, you're, you're totally right. Yeah. So what was your approach to achieving fire? To achieving fire? Um, I guess it really comes from kind of the name of your channel, like you said. So you were more of the saver where Chris was the property investor. Essentially. Yeah. Um, that's you captured it in a nutshell, uh, nutshell really. Um, Chris's approach is different than mine. So his is more invest aggressively, um, start multiple businesses, cut expenses, use credit cards intelligently. And mine was um, save aggressively, work mul multiple jobs simultaneously, uh, cut expenses, but in different ways than he did. Um, he eventually taught me how to learn, learn how to use credit cards intelligently. Um, and then um, I just dipped my toe into investing. So we have very different strategies. And what I've discovered is that there are multiple ways to do this. There is no one right, right, right way and one wrong way. And like, you can do some things wrong. You can make mistakes, but as long as you do one or two or three things right, it ends up being okay, you know, for most people on average. Um, and it helps to have two people who ha are, have a like mindset um, approaching it in different ways. Like Chris would invest in, like you said, um, real estate aggressively, but also stocks, crypto, precious metals, uh, stuff I won't even touch, like NFTs, pink sheets when he was um, younger and much more risky. Um, and then I, you know, my savings was like high yield savings accounts, bonds, um, regular checking accounts like nothing nothing fancy nothing that paid much interest or any interest at all sometimes and um, mine was just to work for someone else for companies like it's salary jobs and side gigs and his was to start companies so he has three different companies these are these are very different approaches and his his has been much more lucrative his pathway than mine he makes his money move he sends his dollars out like soldiers and they capture prisoners in the form of more dollars and they bring the dollars back 
Um, whereas my money was just kind of sitting and interest or I wasn't really earning too much interest and inflation was eating away at it. So that's something that he had to really work with me on. And I'm kind of like a hoarder, not clinically diagnosed, but like I save hall passes for middle school. Like I still have all my schoolwork. Like I save receipts. I save like the little ties on the bread bags. So I, I change wow. money okay. the same way as I <laughs> just kept it. I was about to say you're not alone because I still have like my French social security card from when I lived in France. But when it came to like bread, bread ties, I thought mm, this is a step further that I probably go. <laughs> what if you need them though in the future, like to tie something up or something? Oh, okay. Actually, okay. So if we're talking about it from that perspective, then yeah, sometimes I save the ties because I thought... I thought you might be talking from like a, a memorabilia no. perspective for like a bread tie. I was like, mm, okay, from a practical yeah. perspective. Yes, I get it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah, no, I'm, I'm the same. Like I'll save, I'll save like, um, like I reuse like plastic bags, mm -hmm. plastic bags, normal, that. but yeah. also like, um, but like the, not, not plastic bags, but like, like the Ziploc bags mm -hmm. for like food. I do that too. Uh, if it's not been, if it's not been something like chicken or, you know, yeah. something messy, then I'll, I'll yep. reuse them. The rubber bands from the okay. fruit, from the produce and slide them off. I don't cut them. Yeah. And then I put them in a Ziploc bag full of rubber bands and then I reuse them for socks to bundle socks together. Yeah. So do you do yeah. that with money then? But, uh, do you treat your money like your, um, twisty ties? And stay in it? Uh, I do try and save a lot yeah. of money. Yes. Like I talked about this in, uh episode four with mr money jar so i he talked about the 50 30 20 rule where it's like however much you add you know 50 percent for your needs 30 percent for your wants 20 percent for investing or whatever order whereas i thought yeah whereas i thought you know i've had like pay rises over the past years um and i always thought well no like if i keep the percentages then my lifestyle is going to mm -hmm. inflate so let me just build this budget from scratch each time, not spend more Same than here. I need. Maintain that lifestyle and then anything else surplus is extra to save, to invest, to do whatever. That with. sounds very sensible. So that, that, yeah. That's been my approach. Yeah. 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 Not to discredit, you know, the 50, 30, 20 rule. Like it definitely, I'm sure it definitely helps a lot of people. Um, it's just a different approach that I, that I take. And like I said earlier, there are multiple ways to do this well. Exactly. But you don't yeah. have to be perfect and follow one strategy. Yeah. What I am curious, though, is like as a married couple, how did you and Chris manage to work together and reconcile two different mentalities and strategies to fire to make it work? For oh, the he had to you? teach me. Um, yeah, he okay. had to correct some things. Like I, he's still um, like trying to help me understand certain things. Like um, he said that if I just keep my money in a checking account, and there's inflation, X percent of inflation per year. After 10 years, my money is worth 50% of what it would have been. And that really scared me. So he was like, yeah, you need to do something with your money. I don't care what you do, but you, you need to invest it. And so I um, gave him, like I was saving for a golden visa. So I had, I had quite a bit um, saved. And so he, he was like, you know, Terry, you can't have over a hundred grand in a checking account. This is, this is getting out of control. And this is before, um, like before I, I got the retirement visa. He's like, I under, I understand you're saving for something big. Um, but you need to do something with some of that. And, and so he, it convinced me to pay off our mortgage. And so I, I took 30000 and just paid it off. So I, I, um, I paid off the mortgage in seven years and eight months um, total. Um, I, and I was, I was happy to let it drag out for another several years. And he explained a few things. Like he said, one, this is how much interest you'll save. Tens of thousands of dollars in interest if you, if you pay larger chunks now. So he got me to do that a couple times before. He'd... Um, about it was, he, he, he made the mortgage rise. It kept rising like, um, because 
there was like homeowner's insurance that got wrapped in and then he refinanced so that um, instead of being 30 years, it was 15 or something. So the mortgage payment went up. Oh, okay. I, I mean, I signed the paperwork. I came to the bank and stuff and I, I trusted him. Um, but he's like, this saved $40,000. Like, you're going to thank me in the in the long run. I was like, okay, I trust you. I'm not happy that my mortgage payment went up, though, because it was my job to pay the mortgage. Um, that was the deal. Yeah. He paid for everything else, like my cell phone, um, car payments, car insurance, um, property taxes, utilities, renovations. I pay the mortgage, 100% of it. And um, even if I'm living in New York City, or California, and I have those rent payments up there, I still had to pay the mortgage and, and never missed a payment. But he's that, and that was ex- incredibly challenging for me because I was spending like 110% of one income for one job just on housing at times. So he, um, he taught me how to use credit cards to do a balance transfer to pay the mortgage and to pay um, my student loans. So that was like really fascinating because I didn't even know what a balance transfer was. And he basically, like first off, he taught me how to establish credit. Like I had no credit when he met me and he told me that no credit is worse than bad credit. And yeah. Tell that to Dave Ramsey. (laughs) He's not a huge Dave Ramsey fan, actually. Um, Yeah. Yeah, he's he's yeah. got his own approach. Um, he thinks that you you should try to do as much as you can with other people's money because what a gift. Like if other people have faith in you and they trust you enough to lend you, that means that you have good credit and you are trustworthy. They believe in your ideas, in your investments, in your businesses. So he has hard money lenders who trust him that are not banks. Banks have trust him and he's like, you know, look at all these people who will give me tens of thousands of dollars because I'm so responsible. I thought that was an interesting point. Like he pays people back very quickly and with interest. It is an interesting take, yes. And me personally, um, I'm not completely anti debt like to the Dave Ramsey extent, but I do try and limit the role it has yeah. in my life. Um to absolutely, you know, like a, a mortgage, um, and then UK student finance, which is one, a different story and two, you know, when you're 18 years old, like the, you don't understand that. Don't that's, understand a whole, that's a whole nother interest, story. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And I, I but, used yeah. to be that way. If it weren't the influence of Chris, I would never have had a mortgage. I thought mortgages were bad and um, that a credit card would just get you in trouble in life. And he told me like, there's difference between good debt and bad debt. Like, he taught me everything I know about money. Now, whether it's correct or not, I don't know, but it it worked out. So I have a ton of faith in him, actually, because maybe he was right or maybe it was luck, but it it has worked out. So I would get, um, he, like, basically took me to a jewelry store when we were 22 and 23 and um, bought me a ring with his credit and said, um, you're going to pay it off and you're going to pay it um, cause he, I, he had to co-sign, I think to establish for, to help me establish credit cause I didn't qualify. And he said, you're going to pay it twice a month more, like more frequently. And then I qualified for some other like clothing store, um, credit cards, like on my own and, um, paid them more than the minimum balance, like twice a month. So I pay them like completely off and that kept increasing my credit score until I had, Um, like close to his credit score which is like close to perfect and then he um, I would get like notifications in the mail saying no interest no payment for 12 months no interest no payment for 18 months I would throw them away and he'd say stop doing that (laughs) open those up that's free money what are you what are you talking about and he he would it would say like okay your credit limit is 7,800 was the first one you're going to do a balance transfer for $250. I'll teach you how to do it. And you're going to put 7800 on your student loan payment. So it pays, because um, it would pay the the interest first. The bank gets paid first. He taught me about amortization. and that, But that would lower your principal a bit. So enough to make a dent in the principal. So now your high interest is on a little bit lower of a principal. And then he had me keep doing that. And when the interest arm would go up on the credit card, I'd pay the credit card completely off. 
sometimes he had to help me because that's like a lot to pay at once if you haven't been making monthly payments. So he taught me to like make as high monthly payments as I could. And he, so then um, I was ready to do it with a mortgage. It's like I bought better offers. I got 15,000 and 20,000 and um, I, I did that and paid the entire mortgage in seven years and eight months. And so that was, um, that was all him teaching me like that. I would had no idea how to do stuff like that before I met him. And then um, he had me move half my money into some sort of investment. So I did like Robinhood, Acorns, um, some crypto, and um, lent him like um, tens of thousands of dollars t- for rental properties. And then he paid me a return on investment every month. And I, I was upset when I was putting my money in all these different accounts and giving it to him. But then I got money in return every month. Like I had dividends, I got rent payments. So then I eventually just didn't have to work. Yeah. Yeah. Happy days. Winning strategy listened, in the end. Yeah. yeah. It like could be that. bad because like, what if your significant other isn't honest and he just takes your money and doesn't pay you and he controls that yeah. money, that portion that is not in Robin hood and in, in crypto and, in, um, well, I closed Acorns. I sold all my Bitcoin. Um, yeah, I sold all my stocks except for my ETF. Um, but yeah, like, um, and also he had me open up an IRA and um, he put in a yearly amount. Um, I think it's up to 7000 now. And I, I kind of felt bad. So like, and I started contributing to it too, because it can't just be all him. But yeah, now I have a lot less money in um, in checking and savings, but it is used more intelligently instead of just allowing inflation to eat away at it. Yeah, yeah. that's good, yeah. Something I wanted to ask you as well that kind of came out from what you were saying is you see it as your money mm-hmm. and his money. Like you don't see it as our money. What 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 led you guys to take from that philosophy? It was, we had always had separate okay. bank accounts. We have lived in separate households for half the relationship, which is not normal. Whilst being married. married as well. Yeah, the entire engagement, the first five years of the marriage. Wow. Yeah. So we're completely separate individuals. Um, like, we'll, we'll borrow money from each other and pay each other back with interest. Like, we track money. Like, we don't... There is no... Sh- um, we did open a joint bank account in Spain, though. That was the only thing, but it only had like a okay. few thousand euros in it. <laughs> yeah. That's very interesting, mm-hmm. yeah. My, my aunt t- taught me to do that. She was like, do not ever mix your money. Yeah. Okay. So what were some of the biggest challenges you had on your way to achieving FIRE? It was really challenging to pay the mortgage while I my rent in New York City was, I mean, it's just so high. Like it's... I can't even begin to imagine. Yeah. So I had to work multiple jobs simultaneously, which exhausted me. Um and same thing yeah. with California, the California rent. I mean, there was one month where my contract in California for my apartment had run up. It was a six or eight month lease. And so I was renting month to month, which means the monthly charge for rent was much higher than normal, um, like 10 to 15% higher. So I was paying that increased rent and I had to put a down payment like first and last on an apartment in New York because I was switching jobs. And I had to do that while not missing a mortgage payment. So I was paying for three properties in one month. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That was challenging. Yeah. That is tough. <laughs> yeah, that is tough. Uh, I can imagine that. Yeah, partic- it's got to be frustrating as well. Like you and you're working towards fire and just obstacles of life just yeah. get in your way. It's, yeah. Uh, yeah, it was a bad month. I, I was really upset that month. Um, but what had happened, occasionally this happens to salaried workers and it's just luck. Um, but when it happens, it gr- it's great. As uh, you're transitioning out of the one job and starting the other, there's this overlap sometimes where you're receiving both paychecks at the same time. And that was happening at that point. So, And had it not happened, I would have had to use my savings, which would have been really upsetting um, to make those payments. But I was you know, you imagine a job after all your deductions is paying four to 5,000 a month, but then so is the other. So you're okay. Like you're bringing in 10,000, but maybe seven or eight went out 
in mortgage and rent. It's it's actually okay. I was mad, but it it, it was okay. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, good. And was there a particularly big sacrifice or any major sacrifices you had to make on the way to financial independence Living as well? Roommates um, until almost age forty. <laughs> Um, I think like Ugh. 15 years with roommates. Um, like, yeah, I finally stopped in 2021. So I think, and I shared a room for nine years of my life. That's including like with my little sisters and like undergraduate door rooms, they stick you in with a roommate. Um, and then housemates for another 15 years following that. And so I just didn't have any privacy or sanity um, because sharing a space um with people who i wasn't related to wasn't fun all the time yeah no i can it would be something that i'd find difficult to go back to today if yeah, I were in that yeah. situation. um that's also how i was able to make rent and mortgage was we would rent a room in the house one or two for like 500 each and then that we have a big house because um, we bought right after the 2008 financial crisis. So, yeah. Yeah, I remember you said that, yeah, when we first spoke. <laughs> nice. Now let's talk about when you got to fire, Tara. Uh, so what did you do to celebrate, first of all, when you got there? It's funny that you should ask that because I actually did have a small celebration. Um, I was born out of frustration because I was laid off and um, just sort of snapped and was like, I'm not unemployed. I'm retired. <laughs> That's it. I'm never going yeah. back to work. <laughs> yeah. And I threw a, like a little party for myself with a retired couple. It was very intimate. I just went over to their apartment. They have like a nice deck in the middle of the city with a cool view and brought some kava and some um, snacks. And um, the guy had retired the year before and his wife was um, like the owner of the local newspaper. But so like she could have retired, but just loves her work and owns the paper. And like, so she... She, I thought she'd be super judgmental, like, what are you doing? You're out of your mind. But she was supportive, and they listened to me talk about my frustrations, about my career, and how it just didn't go the way I wanted it to go. And um, I told them I'm moving to Spain on a retirement visa. I had not even applied for the visa yet. I hadn't even started the process. And they're like, okay, okay. And I, I did what I said I was going to do. I moved to Madrid about eight months later on a, or six months later on a retirement visa. And um, I have not gone back to work um, full time, nine to five commute, like anything that resembles regular work, normal work, um, salary yeah. benefits. I haven't done that. And it's been four years now. So I think it's safe to say that even though I'm, I'm working a little bit part time here and there, um, I kind of did retire. Like maybe I'm quasi retired or semi retired. I'm out of the rat race. Yeah. I can, I can say that, honestly. Exactly. So, yeah, what led you to go back to um, working, like, just on a part-time basis? Uh, having worked so hard to achieve fire, to be free, and to live the life you wanted, how did it end up being that you went back into some form of work? Yeah. Um, well, it's sort of like, it's not a party if you do it every day. If you eat pizza every day, you get sick of pizza. <laughs> what a that's yeah. a great caption. <laughs> the great, yeah, um, great phrase. <laughs> yeah, that and like I had built up a lot of skills over the years, and I'd found myself like still paying for certifications and going through courses, and you know practicing um, Excel and statistical software pro um, programs is and data visualization programs um, at least once or twice a week. And so I, I kind of was like, what if I lose all my skills and can never return to work even if I want to? What are the choices actually taken away from me? And like, do I really want to lose these skills? I enjoy learning for learning's sake. And I enjoy doing something useful, kind of waking up in the morning and having a purpose, having a little bit of a structure and routine little bit of a schedule so there was something lost that was difficult to articulate there was a void and then like 
I just didn't calculate certain things into my fire number. Like, how am I going to continue investing? Like, sure, I can continue the same lifestyle, but how do I like to, to lower my average today or like 50 to to $100 a day for the next several months? Like, how do I make a down payment on a new property, a new investment property, like, if I want to? Like, I hadn't calculated that stuff into my firing number or like, what if I want to donate more to charity? Like, it is kind of nice to be able to have a little bit of an income coming in so that you're not like just relying on passive income and um, savings or like selling investments or um, like my husband's happy to pay for everything. He's a really generous guy, but like I don't necessarily want that. So that I, you know, I want to feel like independent and like I'm contributing to the household and everything. So I, I, I hadn't thought those things through. I just sort of rage fired after I was laid off, you know? <laughs> You're killing it with the terminology today. I'm loving it. <laughs> rage rage fired. Yeah. It's like rage it's like rage quitting on the PlayStation, yeah. but oh, in yeah. real life. <laughs> You're gonna have some great like intro <laughs> bloopers or whatever you wanna call them. <laughs> ah, this is staying in the full episode, Tara. Everyone's great. gonna enjoy Open this. <laughs> So, you, obviously, we just talked, you went back to working. Uh, but what was one of the things that you most enjoyed about FIRE? Like, what was the biggest plus or positive that you enjoyed whilst you were, or whilst you are still in some mode of FIRE? Let's um, say. Yeah, the, I would say the freedom and flexibility and control I had over my life. Like, I, yeah. I now work when I feel like it, if I feel like it. And I start when I feel like it and I stop working when I feel like it. I set my own schedule. I don't take on work I don't want to do. I don't ask permission to go on vacation or stop working. So I I really like those aspects. Because I own my own boutique uh, consulting firm, I, I can engage in job sharing and I can delegate in a way that I couldn't when I was a salaried employee. So those have been alternative work structures that have been really satisfying for me i think if i would have had permission to engage in those that type of working those, those um alternative structures in my career i would have lasted longer um so that yeah it's just having that freedom and flexibility and control yeah it's perfect yeah it's exactly what uh, the first guest on the podcast she said as well she was like it's being able to work when i want where, where I you want, want is really important too. with who i want yeah yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and now, kind of the big question. Was the sacrifice worth the result in the end? Absolutely. Yeah. I, I don't think I could ever go back. Yeah. It'd have to be an amazing job for me too. Um, I'd be giving up so much. Like quality of life matters so much more than quantity of money. Yeah. I think I... The more I live, the more I agree with this as well. Um, when I was earlier 20s or mid-20s, I definitely focused more on building the money, getting the capital. Now, late 20s, I'm still in that mindset of like build and accumulate what I can, but I do start to appreciate more of the quality of life as aspect of things like, as well. It makes sense in those stages in your life to be focused on those things. Yeah. Yeah, there comes, there comes a point when you have to start yeah. enjoying things a little bit more. Yeah. <laughs> So Tara, it was it has been Likewise. great speaking to you. Uh, very valuable, great to learn about not a, not just the good side of fire, but also some of the challenges that come with it, which I think is important to highlight as well. So uh, in every episode, I always ask people uh, that come on the podcast to answer a fun question, and I'm sure you I read your fun question in advance. You, it's related what you to picked for me. It, you know what? It was so funny. So. The fun question, and then I'll give a bit of context to it, is tell us about the dancing video in Harlem. So there is a short on your channel. You even told me about this before I think you put it on YouTube. Um, and then I saw the video. The way you described it, it sounded pretty wild. But then I saw it in press. I was like, yeah, this is something else. <laughs> but it was just truly, tell the people. What, tell the people we want to know. Yeah. <laughs> And I'll link the, I'll link the okay, shorts thanks, so that if people yeah. want to watch it, then uh, um, it kind of is like So I lived yeah. in Harlem um, by choice yeah. in the heart and soul of Harlem, like central, central Harlem, when I was teaching at um, Columbia. 
And um, people, yeah. ever since I was a PhD student there, I was moving further and further into Harlem. Um, because like that was the goal. I was like really intrigued with the neighborhood. Like it has such rich um, culture and entertainment, like good shopping, local stuff. And, and like it had like there's like um like a cat club that brings in like cabaret singers and dan- like f- performing artists from all over the world. And there's the Apollo Theater and there's like bougie restaurants and um like just People were just like, I want to go to Times Square. I want to go to the ti- the the Statue of Liberty. I w- they would take me to the same. They wouldn't take me. They would kind of drag me to the same half a dozen things every time they come and visit. And when you're in New York, people use your apartment as um, a hotel room. So I I got so tired of going to Calle Ocho every single time and like the movies in Times Square. So. I had invited a state representative to speak to a class I was substituting for at Columbia. And um, she, she'd she flown up on her own dime. And um, she was like, after class, do you want to hang out? What do you want to do? Because she'd like had a hotel for like two or three days in New York. And I said, can you just humor me for an evening? Can you just, instead of going to Times Square or Ellis Island or something... Can we just hang out in my neighborhood? Because my neighborhood is really cool and nobody is interested in it. I haven't been able to convince a single person to spend an evening in Harlem. And she was like, yeah, sure. And um, so she she like starts looking up. I know the restaurants to go to. Like I took her to this bougie French restaurant that was owned by like a woman from the Caribbean. And she like sit down next to all the patrons and talk to them and make sure their food is good. And they're having a good time. I took her to a swanky cocktail bar called Chocolate. I showed her Don Lemming's apartment. Like, and then um, she was like, let's go to the Apollo Theater. How do you feel? Um, the tickets were kind of expensive too. It was amateur night. And so I was like, yeah, let's do it. I've always wanted to go. And um, so by the time we get there, we've had um, a few few cocktails. And we're, we're loose and we're having a good time. And I um, we had um, two seats next to each other in an aisle. And I didn't know what amateur night was. There are all these middle schools and high schools and elementary schools from all over the city and the state that come in to perform. And their performances are quite rehearsed like they're some of the best groups in the country they are impressive young people this is perfect for me somebody who studies positive youth development so um but i didn't know what was going to happen i didn't know they bring people on stage um to warm up the audience and so i there's like a band on stage and i am just dancing in business casual what i wore to teach like pencil skirt zipped up blouse up to my neck like high collar like prim and proper and um but making a fool out of myself dancing and this like usher is like oh this one get this one and I could hear that and he takes me by the arm he's like follow me ma'am and I'm like what okay like where are we going and he leads me on stage and so stand back there and I stand next to this this woman and she looks like she's part of the act she's an African-American woman and she's got like rhythm and it's going like this and she so she looks like everybody else on stage and uh i didn't see like the other person they brought up who was next to her and so i started talking asking her uh what i'm doing on up there and i start realizing she doesn't know what she's doing up there either and she's not part of the act and there's like there's like two three dozen white people in the whole place so like the what they they ask like each of us they they bring this other guy that I didn't see that like, was next to her they bring him to the center and stage and they tell him do something dance for like thirty seconds or something and he spins on his head he's a break dancer I think he's from Eastern Europe he's got like a thick accent that I don't recognize and it, this is the most incredible skilled break dancing I've ever seen it I was like wow and he's like okay audience that the kind of mc is like clap if you like it and so they they clap and then they pull her up and she's like wish me luck i'm like luck for what and so she dances she does great but she's like a middle-aged 
mom, like a woman in her 50s, like, you know, she had no plan either. She's definitely not going to break down on her head. And then they pulled me up and I'm like, how am I going to follow these people up? Like, these people are so much more skilled than me with so better rhythm. And so I just did like the most hokey, stereotypical white people dances that you and like for the audience to see like this uptight white woman in her business business casual doing the most stereotypical white people dances like the sprinkler or the shopping cart like i i couldn't dance very well so i i was like i'm just gonna lean into this and they so then they had um they 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 said like okay you're 30 seconds of fame are up go back there and then they had the audience vote on what they liked better by clapping. And so they pointed to the guy. He should have won. He was a break dancer. This is like the worst example of like pretty white girl, middle class privilege. Like I was the worst dancer. And then people clap for her. And then the crowd just erupts and goes wild and claps the most for me. And I'm like, why? And so the MC like, it's con- it goes like, congratulations, Tara, you won. And I was like, I didn't know I was in a contest. And then they're like, okay, get off the stage, all of you. I go back to my seat, and it turns out that my colleague, the state representative from the Florida like House of Representatives, she filmed the whole thing. Ah, that yeah. was, that was yeah. she was on the camera. Like, oh, <laughs> oh, you were great. Because yeah. like, I was so bad, I was good. Like they were watching a train wreck on stage and they loved every second of it. And like, train. even when I like <laughs> went home and the, we saw all the acts, the audience poured out, I like, she got a cab and I ran in my pencil skirt home in my like ballet flats and, you know, like in the middle of winter, like my tights and my coat and everything. And people recognize me and they're like driving by me in their cars, like beeping the horn with their windows down, like, like encouraging me and I'm just like oh my god like these people are so cool <laughs> you become a lot of so legend nice. after that <laughs> night <laughs> I was wondering if it's like when Chris saw that <laughs> if he was like so Tara dance last night I mean he's used to my awful dancing so he got a kick out of it <laughs> like he wasn't that surprised because I I'll dance like it doesn't take much to get me to dance I like it and I don't care what well, people think, obviously. You know, I have an alien theory of dancing. Yeah, yeah. Like, if an alien is observing us, and no matter how good of a dancer you are as a human being, the alien's not going to understand the difference between good dancing and bad dancing. The alien is just going to say, what are they doing? Are they having nervous breakdowns? Yeah, yeah. Are they having a mental health crisis? Why are they jerking their bodies in such strange movements? Is something wrong? Even to like Burishnikov, right? It's all gonna look weird. So you might as well just do whatever you feel like when you dance. Everyone looks like an idiot. That's yeah. so funny. That's so funny. <laughs> amazing. Well, Tara, it's been great speaking to you. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Guys, as usual, I will leave the links to Tara's uh, content in the description. Thank you, Johnny. So I hope you enjoyed this episode, guys. You can check out the video description on YouTube and the show notes on different podcasting platforms in order to see where you can find Tara's content. If you'd like to support the podcast and the work that Millennials with Money does, then you can check out the membership options either by becoming a member on YouTube or by supporting the channel and becoming a Patreon. And of course, you'll get access to exclusive content and some benefits as a thank you for your contribution. So with that said, till next time, I'll see you on the next one. And let's get this money.